Hi everybody, welcome to another episode of Our Context. It is Daytime Bex, the Rapper Raccoon, the crazy one, the one that you all love. So, the show's gonna be a little bit different. Unfortunately, Dakota and Ashley are both sick with the flu, so they will not be joining us. No jokes this time, just wish them a fast and speedy recovery. The show's not the same without them. But, would it be Our Context without our producer, the star of the show, Adrian. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another edition of the Out of Context Show for uh, January. And it's going to be a good one. We have some special people uh, on deck. And of course, uh, Ashley and Dakota, we wish them uh, a nice, speedy recovery because the show isn't a show without them. But uh, I'm going to turn it over to the host because she is the host. This is our big time, Bex. So this is a big time show. So I'm going to step aside here and let her do her thing. All right. Well, because Dakota and Ashley couldn't join us, we do have a very special person. I love this person with all my heart. Like, instantly, as soon as I met her, I was like, oh my God, we're friends. And she is the light of everybody's eye. She's who helps Dakota become a better person all the time, every day. She challenged this way that I think, even. It is our one, the only the girl with the purple hair, Chloe. It's me. I'm Chloe. I'm Dakota's girlfriend. Um, and I love Becky. She's awesome. We're really good friends. So um, oh. we have some pretty cool conversations. And I'm really excited to be here. Awesome. I'm glad you're excited. Um, so as some of you may know, Chloe has been a part of a few past episodes when it was still we're trying to figure things out. So it was a little chaotic in those episodes. So we're gonna have a little bit more docile version of Chloe. So I do have a couple of questions for you guys. The question is, you have the ability to become a vampire. You've got all the powers that you could ever dream of with a vampire. You can go in sunlight for a short amount of time. Not something like you could go to the beach for a day and not deal with the repercussions of it. But you can eat human food, you just don't get nutrients from it. You can turn other people into vampires if you want to. But in order to survive and continue with your powers and continue the immortality, you have to kill one person once a week, drain them completely dry. You can't just feed off of one person here, one person there. No, it has to be this one person you kill. Would you do it? And if you were to do it, how would you determine who to kill? And what would your reasonings be? And with that being asked, well, let's start with you. Okay, so I would like to start with the fact you said I could have any powers that I want. Mm -hmm. All right, the only thing that sounds bad about this deal to me is the sunlight thing. Because I love nature, bro. I be outside all the time. I think in this scenario, I would like figure out because I got to be super smart because I have all the abilities. So I would figure out a way to put some sort of like something over my skin that can permanently stay there so that it wouldn't burn me. First of all, I would do that. Okay. But in regards to having to kill somebody every week, um, with like having all the abilities, right? You, you can mind read you know things about people that maybe you wouldn't know um, just by looking at them normally. So, I mean, you get rid of like some super bad people, but you get to live forever. Hey, you know. <laughs> I, I um, like that mindset. <laughs> um, I feel like in this scenario, it honestly might be very easy to find people because again like I said you can mind read and stuff so like read your mind you're a pedophile you're next you know? all right mm -hmm. any other also, points you want to add Dakota's getting turned into a vampire if oh, I have yeah, to live definitely. forever so um but yeah other than that I mean honestly I would be a vampire hitman I you can see. hire me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, um, I don't know, people that wanted, like, really bad, like, 
I don't know, political leaders or some shit. <laughs> like, oh, am I allowed to swear on here? Yeah, definitely. Okay, okay. Um, but, at, like, high-profile victims that I could give a lot of money for, I can be invisible. So, all I'm saying is I might do that, too. All right. Now, I'm going to bounce that question over to Adrian. Okay, I'll take it apart. This time I'll go a different route. <clears throat> Excuse me, editing. Um, I'll take a different route with that. Um, being with a vampire, would I make another person join me? I would say no. I would just be on my own. Because the relationships as I make, as I don't die, I could just, you know, watch them die of old age and just go on to the next person. Now, being a vampire... I wouldn't be discreet. I would not be discreet whatsoever. Because I would attack at will at night. And people will, people will see my face. People will understand who I am. But I couldn't be stopped. I couldn't be killed. I couldn't be caught. So I would so be... You could be killed. It just would be extremely difficult to kill you. <laughs> right. But I mean, I would really play it smart. Because, you know, the, the, the person who sees my face would be the last thing they see. You know, you know, before they die. So it'll make it extremely very difficult to kill me. And who would I, and how would I determine who I would kill? That right there, it would be indiscriminate. Because eventually, with technology and everything, people would try to find out my pattern. So why would I waste my time going after, hypothetically speaking, you know, pedophiles or mass murderers or, you know, or the quote-unquote evil people in the world because they're going to see my pattern. So they're going to protect those particular groups of people. So if I kill indiscriminate, indiscriminately, there's no pattern. You just never know when I'm going to strike, which is going to build up a fear for the people of the United States or Germany or Japan. And in all the sense of the word, it's going to bring that particular group together, actually. So I'm kind of doing a service along with taking out some people here and there. I'm going to bring people closer together by killing a lot of people for my own selfish needs. So just to counter one thing you said, <clears throat> they're going to know you're going to kill one person once a week, though. They just won't know when or where. So they would know that it's somebody who has to drain somebody completely dry. Mm-hmm. And they might find ways to kill you. They're going to try several different ways. So, you got to make sure you're on the move constantly. Well, but if you really think about it, would you want to live forever? You know, you can go for 50, 60, 70 years. But then after a while, either A, you'll get bored. B, you know, your taste of victims will, will change or you'll just stop altogether. And living that long, eventually you, you want to die. That's a good point. For me, what I would do, if, say, in some world, I became a vampire, and I was given all this power, I was told you have to kill one person once a week, I don't know if I could. I know I make jokes, like, I'm a very violent person, like, I like causing mischief harm. I don't like causing serious physical bodily harm. So I don't know if I could actually bring myself to kill somebody, but thinking about being a vampire and that hunger, like, when you're really hungry, you're just going to eat whatever's in front of you. And I think that is one point that a lot of people miss. It's like, you're not going to be in control if you have a good conscience like I do, where I'm like, I make jokes all the time. Chloe knows these jokes. I'm always like, I'll go after this person. Who is it? Let's go. But if it came down to it, I couldn't do it. But I feel like the hunger and everything would make me do it. And it's not like I could be like an Edward Cullen, sparkly vampire. Hello, it's just me. I sparkle. And be like, I'm just going to eat animals because you have to have human blood. Now, say hypothetically, I get over that moral complex, the issue with could I kill somebody? I 
don't know who I would go after because I could easily say, like Chloe, I'll go after the pedophiles. I'll go after the mass murderers. I'll go after people who are causing nothing but harm for other people. But at what point, one thing that I think we have to think about is who are we to be judge, jury, and executioner? Wouldn't that make us just as evil? Because at that point, we're murdering somebody's friend, somebody's family, somebody that somebody cares about. Well, but... Now... Oh, I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to train on thought. Go ahead. Go ahead. But if we're going to get really deep into the weeds on this, who says it's wrong? Other than a book. And who created a book? Man created a book. So, if you think about it, everything that's created is made up. We, as a society, created certain laws and certain things just to keep us in order. I always go back to the joke of, you know, primitive, primitive man, you know, is getting along with one another and we see Jim Bob there in a corner shagging a sheep. We don't want to see Jim shagging that <laughs> sheep because, you know, that kind of kills our food supply right there. So we're like, you know, let's come up with something so Jim won't do that anymore. I got it. Hey, Jim, could you put that sheep down for a second? Because if you don't, something is going to strike you dead. So we're going to say that's wrong. So that's where those laws came up with. Those ideals came up with because we don't want to see Jim fucking a sheep anytime soon because that kind of messes up our food order right there. So I say that to say this. Being a vampire, you're going to have to feast, just like you said. And you can't roast on, you can't feed on animals or anything. You're going to have to have that taste. And so your moral compass goes out the window. Because yes, you can hunt for the quote unquote bad people in the world. But after 20 or 30 years, Becky, you're like, okay, there is no, there is no bad person. Because if that's the case, what does that make me? And, and how do I, you know, how do I figure that out within myself if I need to go feed again for the next week or else I die? Well, let's see if Chloe has any thoughts on this. I do. I have, um, I've been stocking them up. They're like listed in my head right now. Um, so I watch Rick and Morty a lot. Okay. I love that show. One of the like main kind of, um, moral, like, issues they deal with is the difference between good and bad um rick is constantly talking about how good and bad is a construct and similar situations and that is something that i think about a lot um i am somebody who has what i feel is a very like strict set of of morals um i'm a very open-minded person but the morals that i hold are very very near and dear to me um that being said, though, I do often wonder, like, what makes things necessarily good and bad? And while necessarily, like, choosing people because I think that person is bad might not be everyone's cup of tea, it'll make me happy. So I'm cool with it. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, I forgot where I was going with this. No, it was so good. <laughs> we're going with uh, the moral thing yeah so in turn oh i know where i was going with this um and like adrian pointed out if we were in this scenario and we had to feed once a week what is the difference between that and like uh you know a mosquito sucking people's blood you know we all have kill to kill people i know but we kill cows and we kill sheep, we kill chickens, we kill ocean life, we kill everything to eat it, right? So what, I guess, where is the moral line drawn between killing like, you know, a, a, an animal that might be intelligent, might have a family, you know, might have those close connections and is gonna cause some pain towards the other animals like cows. Cows are very social animals. Your cow buddy goes missing. Those cows get sad. So oh, where do we draw the line between <laughs> between that and a vampire hunting for its food? Um, it's it's um, biology. 
That's all. That's all it is. Biology is. Uh, it's your basic survival of the fittest. Mm-hmm. So go back to the, the vampire analogy that that De Becky posed to us. Is it's biology. We're going to have to feed, no matter what. So we really can't separate what we feed on. We just have to feed. You know, give a starving man a cracker. He's going to devour it and think it's the best cracker in the world. Give a rich person a cracker. They're going to look at it and they're going to look at it and they're going to toss it aside. So it's all about perspective. If you're a vampire, you have to feed once a week. You know, you your options are pretty slim for the first time. But then after years, yeah. you know, you're like, okay, I'm hungry. And this is my equivalent of, of DoorDash. I go right down the street. You know, I feast on dear Myrtle because she's feeble. And, she can't, and, and a bitch can't run that fast. So, so there you go. You know, there's your food right there. But in the very beginning, you're going to want to be choosy because that first kill is so important to you and your moral compass is going to be just going crazy because just like we talked about, you want to do the right thing. You want to get that bad person, you know, that's done something wrong that you know in your head that deserves to die. But years later, you're like, okay, Jimmy's dog pooped on my lawn. He's got to go, you know, kind of thing. (laughs) So... I'm just your basic survival of the fittest thing. And being a vampire, in all honesty, it, it wouldn't be fun. It would suck, no pun intended. But well, that's, that's an awesome question. And that brings up so many deeper levels than someone just saying, oh, no problem. You know, I'll pick a mass murderer or I'll go on Craigslist and get that weird old creepy guy with the rapey van and I'll, and I'll attack him. But uh, no, me... You know, the, you know, the field's wide open. Um, it's my buffet of uh, people I'll feast on. Except for midgets. Not midgets. Can't do it. So, this guy reminds me, this entire conversation, remind me of a conversation I had in college. Oh, I was huge on debating because I had a class called Ethics. And it went off of philosophies and stuff. Like, oh, if you had a ring that made you invisible, what would you do with it if no one knew or saw? Those kind of questions. And I had a debate with the professor. And I said to him, our morals are social constructs. If we were in a world where rape, incest, and murder was okay, we wouldn't bat a fucking eye. And he said, no, 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 I, I was born where that was wrong. And then he went into like saying, like proving my point later on. I was like, motherfucker. (laughs) So that's a good point that you both brought up because the fact that good and bad really is just a social construct where we have to do what's okay by our peers. You have to get a good job. You have to get married. You have to get that nice car. You've got to get that new phone, the new this video game system, whatnot. Because it's social construct, it's socially acceptable that way. As a vampire, human social nature is out the window. And I think it still comes down to the point of one thing I want to ask Chloe that kind of made me go, hmm, wouldn't you murdering or feasting on a pedophile or a mass murderer be the same thing as just throwing them into a jail cell with using it like life fodder because you have the free range chickens that would have the nice cushy jail cell or you would have the ones that are in a very unwelcoming environment right right um, for context, Becky and I were talking about, um, we had a very lengthy conversation the other day about our um, prison system. So I think this is kind of what she's, what she's referencing. But I honestly did not even draw the comparisons between those two things. Like, my entire point when I was talking to you about that was what is throwing bad people in bad environments do for us? It does nothing good for us as a society. So what ends up happening is good people get that get lumped in with the bad people or maybe are in there for things that 
you know, maybe it shouldn't be illegal. They but get let's treated the same. So, so yeah, I just want to include too, Chloe. I'm mm-hmm. saying this, like, say hypothetically, the vampire thing happens, but you don't have my breeding abilities. Okay, so if I don't, <laughs> yeah. specifically, so, I don't want black breeding abilities. Yeah, you don't but... have that ability where you can read mm-hmm. that this person is means this with bad intent or they've right. done these things. You're going based off of research that you've done and based off of the social justice system. Right. Say you're hunting just prisoners. Right. How would you pick? So I actually was thinking about something that Adrian said. And I think that after a while, eventually humans would just become a food source to you, right? You probably wouldn't make any meaningful relationships with any humans because they're going to die anyway, which is why I would bring Dakota because I would go freaking crazy. But eventually they would really just become a food source to you. So at what point do you just start going for maybe, um, and it also depends on like what's going to be the healthiest for my vampire body. I mean, is it going to be more beneficial for me to go for somebody who might be a little bit older because they're a little bit less able to fight back? Or would that not be good because of the nutritional value? Like, do I need a a young, healthy person to to really fill me up for the week? Or, you know, is it going to be like, if I eat a child, I have to eat four more? (laughs) That's a good question. (laughs) And, like, on top of that, what if I eat somebody who's, like, like, just very large? Would I be good for two weeks? What about a drug addict? What exactly. if those I drugs that they those consume? Drugs. Also, in this scenario, I'll be doing a lot of drugs. I gotta say that. I mean, um, what else are you gonna be doing? Right, if the drugs aren't gonna kill me, it's fine, you know? It'll be good. But let's say the drugs don't affect you. Uh man, I don't want this no more. <laughs> 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 um... No, that would suck, though. I would be very, very upset about that. Um, But, yeah, so at at what point do you just start, like, doing it based on nutritional value? Hmm. You know, and at some point, I feel like that is what you would end up getting to because while you're – and also something I didn't think about prior to answering the first time is what kind of, I guess, mental toll it would take on me, right? So – I'm a human right now. So right now, if I had to kill a person once a week to live, I would pick bad people, right? Just for my own moral safety. That being said, though, in this vampire scenario, not only do you have to kill somebody once a week, but you also have to eat them. So in doing that, I think it separates the human from you. In a way that maybe your morals go with the human side of you. Uh, um, once again, I have two. I have two trains of thought. And oh, boy, they're going to collide soon. <laughs> yes, yes, they will. So, on one hand, going going back to the vampire thing, and going back to the food source to to piggyback on what Chloe said, you know, you can feast on somebody if they're old or they're young or stuff like that. And the way I see it is being a vampire. I look at it as like just being a regular human being. Food tastes better if you work for it. If things are easy, it's not respected. If you worked hard for it, the sacrifice for it is so much better. It's one thing to go to McDonald's or grab a hamburger for temporary satisfaction, it's easy. It's another for you to make that hamburger from scratch, go through all the the hassles of doing it and you finally eat it, it's more rewarding. <clears throat> so this is why, if you really think about it, most vampire movies, they lack certain logic. If you're looking to feed once a week, and instead of you going over you know, to Myrtle's house and feasting on her and her dog, why don't you go to a prison? Why don't you purposely get yourself arrested and go to prison? There's your meal source for pretty much the rest of the life you choose to have. You can feed off the prisoners for just many, many years. And, and no one can do anything to you. No one's going to be mad at you or hate you. 
And no one's going to mess with you. You have your meal once a week right then and there. But being in a prison system, some of these people could be innocent and they've got people who love and care about them. And the government's eventually going to put their eyes on you and be like, all right, every time this one person moves from one prison to the next, somebody dies once a week. Well, I mean, but, you know, with, with, with and the... Then, they're going to find a way to kill you. Yeah, I mean, but with the powers I have and, 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 I, and I keep on evolving, you know, then the probability of them catching me is kind of slim to none. I mean, of course, like I mentioned before, you know, 30, 40, 50 years, yes, I'll purposely get caught and I'll purposely die because, you know, my life would be meaningless at that point in time. So, yes, I would, you know, I would equally welcome death, but a good food source would be prison. It's easy. That's, it's easier. Oh, you know, it's easy. It's your buffet, and you know, and and there you go. Right. That's a that's a very good point. Um, what I do have to say about that, though, is I wouldn't want to live in a prison. You know, I don't want to spend. You know, maybe you can phase through the walls of the prison or something with the powers, um, but even though there would be a guaranteed food source. I wouldn't necessarily want to live in a prison. I think if I was in the scenario, honestly, my my brain straight up went to like finding like a little cottage somewhere out in the countryside and just living there for the rest of my life. And then I can like, I don't know, maybe go hunt people in the woods or something. But so I, mean, I, I, I personally, right. I, yep. Um, I wouldn't want to live at that point if I was living just like in a prison like there's not really a point what you said about um after a while your life becomes meaningless our life as they are right now in my opinion is meaningless nothing matters because it's all a construct right that being said you can find meaning in life you can find passions and things that you want to live for um so I guess in that aspect, once you lose those pieces, your life can be meaningless to you. But I guess what's the difference between, because we're all like a blank in the universe, right? So if we're talking grand scale of things, I guess it's all meaningless. It's meaningless as we get older. The older we get, the more we understand life. Generally speaking, a good chunk of us understand life the older we get. This is why if you see older people, a good chunk of them are always smiling, always happy, always laughing because they believe that they... I don't they... know where this good chunk of older people are because I don't see them up here. <laughs> like, they don't come into work. No, no. Well, I... Like, it's not even work. It's anywhere. Like, I see old people. They're like, get out of my way, y'all. Young get off my <laughs> I'm going to keep walking very slowly, but it's fast for me. I, I say generally speaking, most are kind of, you know, happy and happy-go-lucky because a good chunk of them, either if they are miserable, they figured out life because the older you get, the more memories you focus on, the more your life becomes meaningless because you've done so much in life. You can reflect back on your memories and then you're able to ready to take that next step where, no matter where it goes. When you're younger, you have so much to look forward to because you see this big, big thing in front of you that you can dip in, that you can jump into, that you can experiment with and go to. The older, you, the older you get, the more you settle down and you realize that everything I've done had meaning back then, but now it doesn't. You know, so most people are ready to take that next step. Life is meaningless, but you don't figure it out until way later in life. On a happier note, what I would do was would be I would turn my wife into a vampire with me because, like Chloe said, I don't want to do this shit alone. Yeah, no, I and definitely tagging him along with me. I think what I would do, because at that point, I don't need a house to stay in. I don't need to have anything constrict me to one place. I would travel the world. I would literally travel the world, and I would do things that most, like, you couldn't do as a human. We can't, 
dive down to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. Because we need to breathe. We need to be able to eat and, like, the pressure and everything would kill you. Being a vampire, I'd be invincible. I would be diving down there. I think I would want to really explore and experience the world. Because as a human, especially this day and age, and this me speaking as a younger person, um, and I'm sure Chloe can relate because of her being younger than me, we don't have the opportunities that the older generation had where they could save up for a year and just go backpacking and hitchhiking. We can't do that. We can't experience these things that are like once in a lifetime experiences and go backpacking through Europe. Unless of course you're really rich, which I'm not, I'm hardly making ends meet. I'm working my ass off. I'm doing the best I can. Most of us are. I think I would be like, no, I'm going to live my life like it's 1980 without all the racism and the sexism and the homophobia. I'm going to live. But my with life. the cocaine. But with the cocaine. But, and I'm going to live my life. And yes, I will kill one person once a week, but I'm going to enjoy my life. And I think that is like something that could definitely take me a few hundred years to say I've seen everything. I've climbed to the top of Mount Everest. I've dived down to the bottom of the ocean. I've played with the mega shark or whatever. I've seen things that most humans could never see. I'm happy. All right, go to the government facility be like, kill me now, bitch. I'm done. <laughs> I've done it all. Now, I, I, I do have a question uh, for, for you two. Speaking about, you know, um, how you two ladies want to take your spouses with you. My question is, when you've done everything that you can do and you're ready to pass on, do you think your spouse will feel cheated that you chose to leave this world without them? Or if your spouse is ready to leave and you're not ready for them to leave? How would you handle that? Becky? I'll let Becky go first because she's looking like she's uh, chomping at the bit to answer. The thing is, if I was ready to leave, I would talk to my wife about it. I'd be like, I, we've done everything. We've seen everything. You've been to the Titanic. We've swam with sharks. We've done everything we could have ever wanted to. You've seen every side of the ocean. I'm ready. Are you ready? And if she says yes, awesome. If not, too bad you're coming with me. She tries to leave me before that and break her kneecaps, and I'm going to be like, no, now you're stuck with me till I say you can go, and you can't go. Because you're not leaving me here alone. <laughs> and I believe, like, through, like, I'm going to get really sad for right now. My wife and I have been together for almost four years, and I'm still as in love with her as I was when I first fell for her. Even though we've changed and grown as people, I'm still obsessed with my wife. And I think that if we continue to do that, continue to be like, all right, we're gonna just do whatever the fuck we want. We're gonna go play the new video games. We're gonna go and explore things. We're gonna actually travel and see all 50 states. And we're gonna go through all of Canada and all of South America and everywhere else in between. I think we're going to grow closer as people and we could even do our own thing for a little bit. Be like, I'll see you in a month, which for us could be a day at that point and just continue to be who we are, but we have to kill people. <laughs> but yeah, um, my wife can't leave me because <laughs> no. And I think she would find it extremely unfair of me to just be like, all right, I'm a vampire. I'm going to watch you die. And you're never going to see me again. Unless, of course, you're reincarnated and I have to fall in love with you all over again. But that's some stupid, sappy romance novel that I've read a thousand times and I'm good with that theme. I think she'd be more mad at me if I took it and I didn't feel like I, I turned into a vampire. I don't feel pain. I don't get sick. I don't break anything. You get to be mortal, though. And I get to watch you die. 
Chloe? So Dakota and I have talked about situations like this previously. Um, specifically um, in like an apocalypse setting, right? So I have always said if I am in any sort of apocalypse, I'm giving it like a week to go do like the stuff that you don't get to do when you're not in, a, in an apocalypse. And then I'm killing myself because I'm not just going to live through that, right? And Dakota and I have talked about doing it together in this apocalypse scenario, right? I do not want to live in a world where Dakota is not a thing. And just as Becky had kind of said about her wife, I fall more in love with him every day. Genuine, we've been together for two years and like we work together every single day. I'm literally, I, if I am not around Dakota for like a day and a half, I go crazy. Oh my God, you're like a little lost puppy. Literally, dude, like he is, he is one of, if not the most important person in my life. So therefore, and also he would get mad at me, like Becky said, if I didn't turn him into a vampire, he would be pissed. Because we've also talked before about oh. if the other one would turn the other one into a vampire. We have both agreed previously that we would. Um, specifically because neither of us want to live in a world where the other one doesn't exist. I, I think that having somebody with you would put a meaning on living forever. And, you know, once we've done everything we've ever wanted to do, there's always more stuff to do. I don't think there's ever going to be a limit because as we see humanity progress, as we see, um, you know, the world kind of change in different ways, um, nature change in different ways, there's always going to be more things to do unless the entire world is like blown up or something. And in that case, like, yeah, that's an apocalypse scenario. I'm good on that. But I think that when you have somebody with you, I think you can find meaning in anything. I think you can find joy in anything because right now we have like, you know, video games, arcade games, whatever. And 300 years they might have like ultra realistic like simulators or something like and you sort are online right and then also you have to think about if i can live forever i have powers what's stopping me from leaving the earth can i go elsewhere in the universe i mean Your if i source. have yeah but like could i find a different a different like I don't know, intelligent species? Like, does it have to be, it has to be human? It can't be a different intelligent species? It has to be human. <laughs> Which, what, you, what you can do, though, is wait until humans decide that they're going to expand and go colonize another planet, and then you can be like, I, I'm going to be a part of this, because I've lived forever, and you have no idea how old I actually am, and I'm going to just start feeding here. <laughs> also, you could get them there faster. Because if you have hundreds of years or whatever to explore space travel on your own, you can, and obviously you have whatever powers you want to have. One of mine, as I previously mentioned, would have been just like extraordinarily smart. You know, the ability to like um, just ingest information at a ridiculous rate. So let's say I go work for NASA. They don't know that I'm a vampire. That's okay though because I'm gonna get them to Mars and I'm gonna get them to all these other places and you know, whatever. And then you can go explore the galaxy. But also if teleportation is a thing, right? With this, um, what is the limit to that? Can I go teleport to Jupiter and then come back? Because then I could come back from my food source, right? So I, th I think there are many, many, many more things to do than what we might perceive there are to do. Um, there are so many individual experiences that you can have, but I wouldn't want to have them alone. I don't care what amount of time I'm given to do whatever thing. I wouldn't want to do it alone. I would want to do it with Dakota. I just got to say too, if I became a vampire, I would have to turn 
my wife. I would have to turn Chloe. I would have to turn Dakota. And if I didn't turn Ashley, I think she would kill me. She would be the one to kill me. All right, Adrian, you can come along for the ride, too. I guess we gotta include him. No, no, Adrian doesn't want to part of this ride. We know that. I know, I'm just kidding. We know he's gonna be like, you fucking come near me with those things, and I'm gonna scream like a little girl and curl up and cry. Oh, can I bite well, my dog so he lives forever? If it is that way, yes. <laughs> well, I mean, you can bite I'm me, but uh, well, you guys can bite me, but I'll just go off. You know, like some other country and, you know. You're going to be like, all right, I'm going to expose these bitches. Hi, I'm a vampire. <laughs> Please kill me. This is how you kill me. There's some other ones. I'll give you the names. Yeah, Here's exactly. Here's their profile. <laughs> so I'm not turning Adrian. <laughs> so, I, so I do have a question. Uh, not to, once, once again, not to, you know, dig too deep. But, so let's say for example, and I heard this. Uh, in a previous podcast that um, a, a show has this thing toward an asteroid that's coming towards yours within nine months. How would you spend the nine months? Now, keep in mind that everyone, you know, people react differently. So people will party for now, the next month. are we human or are we vampires in this scenario? No, no, we're just... <laughs> no, we're just regular humans. Um, people, you know, obviously have chosen to to go out and party, or to go out and live life, or to go loot, or to go murder because nothing is there. Nothing matters within the next nine months of your life. Nine months is surprisingly very long. And so, and short. yeah, and short. So I'll, I'll pose this question to you guys, but I'll go first, and I'll tell you why. I've heard all the different responses for what I'm going to do, you know, it'll be total anarchy or I'll, you know, start killing because there's really, there's really aren't any consequences. What I would do, which I read about and they talked about is nothing. I would get a job. I would work. I would have some sense of normalcy, you know, my last bit of my amount of time on earth. Because if you're not going out and killing or robbing or looting before the asteroid hit, why do it now? You know, why, I mean, why not keep your sanity and keep a sense of normalcy, you know, before, uh, before the meteor hits? So I'll toss it to our special guest, Chloe, and I'll ask you, what would you do? So I think there is definitely something to be said about when you ask a question similar to that, and a person's immediate response is something something damaging to other human beings, right? My first response to that question when you asked it was, I would spend time with the people I love. I would do things that I wanted to do. Um, and the things that I want to do do not include stealing or looting or murdering or anything like that. The things that I would want to do is I would want to have a picnic at sunset with my boyfriend. I want to go out to a bar and legally drink with my friends. Like I want to, you know, do stuff like that. And I don't think that I would necessarily get a job because there's, there's no point in working for, you know, I mean, at this point, if let's say nine months from now an asteroid was going to hit, Right now, I work at a company that does not value me, um, and they never will value me, and I'm very aware of that. So with my qualifications right now, I wouldn't be able to get a job that matters. I wouldn't be able to get a job that I could say, like, I'm proud of the work that I do, and I have aspirations and goals to be a therapist. That would be a job that if I had at the time, I might keep doing because I feel like I am contributing in some way and doing something, you know? But I think as of right now, I would just spend time with the people I love and do the things that I love. I would go hiking. I would um, go swim in a river somewhere and, like, you know, go, go skydiving or, you know, do the things that, I've always wanted to do in that sense. I'd visit another country 
or uh, assuming that these options are all available and the world hasn't gone to an apocalyptic piece of shit. You know, assuming that these are still options available to me, I would try new foods. I would meet new people. Um, I would go to events and be a lot more social because what's going to (laughs) happen? We're all going to die in nine months anyway. You're not going to remember this cringy moment. You know, I would, I would dance a little harder. I would sing a little louder kind of thing. I think that's what I would do is I would just try to live every single moment to the fullest while I had it. Yeah. And Becky? I'm not sure because that's a very little question because it depends on the world. Um, I'm with Chloe though. I wouldn't want to work. I would want to rack up all the debt I can. Yeah. And just <laughs> live my life um, because I would have to pay it back. We'd be dead. <laughs> um, I would want to see Ashley. I would want to spend my last moments with my wife, spend time with my family. But if the world was going to hell in a handbasket, I wouldn't wait the nine months. I wouldn't want to wait till an explosion happens and it kills me and it could be a painful, slow death or the world implodes and I'm dying from the fact that we're now in space and the gravitational pull and like dealing with all that agony and stuff, I would probably take my own life. I wouldn't want to be around that day. I I just, I wouldn't. I'd probably wait a few months, see if somehow the governments were able to find some way, some scientific, science fiction movie where, oh, we destroyed the asteroid, the world's back to normal, yay! Now we have to collectively, like, clean this mess up that we caused. But I would not want to live through that. I would not want to live through watching people get murdered and raped and beaten and killed and everybody dying of overdoses and stuff. I would probably look at my wife and be like, all right, giving us three months. They don't find a solution for this. We're going to spend three months doing whatever the fuck we want, but I'm not living the last three months. I just wouldn't. I would want to go out my way. And I know that it wouldn't matter because, hey, no one's going to remember it. No one's going to know. But I wouldn't. I would take the coward's way out. I would want to face that. Hmm. Okay. Well, we had to go along with the whole vampire thing, so... Uh, hey, it went with it. Yeah, but, it definitely went with it. So, <laughs> but if I was a vampire, I would be like, "I government, I exist. Kill me. <laughs> Do it now because I don't want to almost die constantly and live in agony for the rest of my life because nobody can kill me now." So, uh, do your thing. So, with the vampire thing, does somebody else have to kill you? Can you not kill yourself? You could kill yourself, but you'd have to be very creative in how you would do it. Because us as humans, the way that we want to kill ourselves is going to be most typically gunshot wounds to the head, hanging ourselves, um, overdoses. Those are the most typical ways. As a vampire, you have to find a stake to go through your rib cage, through the muscle, and into your heart. Your body's not going to let you. Instinctively, your brain wants to survive. It's kind of like how we can bite off our own fingers because they've got the consistency and strength as carrots. Our brains don't let us do it. So, and then you'd have to be willing to have this military grade thing somehow rig it so that you can push this button. But unless, of course, you're 100% sure and you had to be very instinctive and so depressed and so not wanting to live to be able to do it. I don't think anybody who was a vampire would be able to kill themselves just because the brain's not going to want you to. 
That I, is definitely I, true. I agree. Not bad at all. So I do have a question for our special guest, because we have to make her feel welcomed, of course. <laughs> is there anything that you would like to ask the panel? Anything on your mind? Because I mean, your special guest on this podcast is being listened to worldwide in front of so many people, and they want to know about Chloe. What's on her mind? What, what, what things she would like to bring to the Out of Context podcast that will make us think or laugh or get grossed out? And Chloe is trying to like freak out with worldwide. It's only like a thousand people. But hey, it could be worldwide. One That's day. fine. I'm not freaked out. Everyone can listen to me listen to me speak. I have a question that I ask every single person that I meet. Becky has been asked this question before. I don't remember her answer though, to be perfectly honest with you. If you were a serial killer, what would your trademark be? Adrian, you can answer this. Okay, what would my trademark be? Something that they couldn't study. You know, something that they couldn't read about and go, okay, you know, this is what to look for with him, him or her. It would have to be something simple, like a puncture wound behind the ear. You know, that would not be noticed until after a while, you know, to, you know, like to where the coroner sees it or something like that. Just something so innocuous that no one really thinks about it. Most, most serial killers love to leave their calling card because they want to be thought of, remembered, studied, stuff of that nature. For me, it might be a small puncture wound behind the ear or a puncture wound on the side of the ankle. You know, so no, so no two killings will be alike. And if I was going to be, be a serial killer, I wouldn't use any kind of projectiles like a gun with bullets or anything. It'll be a much more intimate killing because, like I said before, the reward is better if you work hard for it. You can shoot anybody. You can, you know, have a bow and arrow or you can have any kind of, any kind of weapon to get somebody from afar. If you do it up close and personal, it's more beneficial. And the margin for error is extremely slim because you don't know who you can run up on. They can defend themselves and kill you and that'll be in the, and that'll be in the end of the day. So, you know, I mean, you have to become a cerebral, you know, serial killer. How about you? For me, I think my calling card would be something I can't control, which would be my hair. <laughs> <laughs> They'd be like, oh, there's a multi different multicolored hair every time. But there wouldn't be a root, so they can't like do the full DNA thing. You just be like, "I right, we know this person colors their hair." But if it was an intentional calling card, I think it would be how the people are killed. It would be the fact that nothing would be chopped off. If I'm breaking the tip of your pinky and I chop it off, you don't feel that pain anymore. No, you're going to feel every single bone in your body break. And it's just going to be the fact that every bone's going to be broken. And they're going to know I took my time doing it. I think that would be my calling card. See, this very is what... Very nice, very nice. See, see, Chloe, this is why I'm not going to visit Becky anytime soon. <laughs> I just keep everything at a safe distance, just in case. <laughs> She's scary with some of the stuff she says. Um, <laughs> however, I think I may have her beat with the horrifics that is the calling card. Um, I would kill people with tattoos. And I would carve the tattoos out of their body and hang them up on my walls. See, as art but... installations. Okay, there's a serial killer like that out there already. Oh, um, is there? They even made movies about them. Um, yeah. Okay, well, I haven't seen them. It's they took the, my idea, goddammit. It's the one who made actual furniture out of skin. Oh, yeah, no, that's yeah. different. No, but it's still kind of the same thing. <laughs> no, it's not. That's totally different. They hung out the tattoos <laughs> as art. Oh, well, I'm not making furniture. But I think my way is a little bit more horrific because of the fact that I'm breaking every single bone in their body. I'm making whatever. them stay alive. 
<laughs> whatever. Or maybe I would tattoo the person. Why well, was there like me? They fall asleep getting the tattoo. I'll just like do it really, 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 really deep. <laughs> just carve out part of them. Like literally, I just. What if I were to, right, take their tattoos off and then try to tattoo it in the muscle? Be fucking like, brutal. Like tattoo would, it again in the muscle. And you would have to make sure, like, you get them some kind of serum where they stay awake during it all, like they can't mm-hmm. pass out or go into shock. Right. We should not be talking about this because somebody's going to actually do this and then we're going to be like... Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of too late now, folks. Listen, too late now. If you're a serial killer out there and you take my idea, I will find you. That's my idea. That's my calling card. <laughs> Adrian, you think <laughs> I'm the rabid one. Um, Chloe's more rabid than me. Yeah, I gotta say, um, Becky's a lot of bark. I'm a lot of bite. Chloe, you're more bark than I am. Okay, that's not true. It is true. You know it. You, you know that. that's not true. Somebody yells at you, you're gonna start crying. Maybe, but uh, you know what? I'll <laughs> yell at him back. <laughs> uh, I cry after the confrontation, Becky. I go to my car and I cry. <laughs> Beforehand, I get mad. You do get mad, but then you start off. And then you cry. I love you. Yeah, I'm going to cry afterwards. That's fine. And I might cry after I kill these people and hang their tattoos up on my walls. Ain't nothing wrong with a little cry (laughs) sesh, Becky. At least I'll do something in the moment. Somebody yells at you and you go. Somebody yells at me, I yell back now. I'm a supervisor. I can do that now. (laughs) I can do that now. (laughs) I had somebody try and yell at me over the phone because I wanted to take a return. I instantly shot them down. I was like, no, this is why I didn't do it. And I was like, this fucking idiot. <laughs> Bro, when it comes to, like, customers at this point, I don't even care. I don't even give a shit. What are they gonna do? They're gonna write me up? <laughs> Please. Please do it. Give it's me like, a chance to express my thoughts. <laughs> your supervisor told me to put my knee badge back on because I was gonna go rip a new old guy a new asshole for yelling at you because you were about ready to cry. You were so upset. Okay, well, oh, yeah, yeah. well I mean, before, I it, before it gets too far... <laughs> Anyways, Before it gets too far, I know where you live. I know where you live. So we will. So we will. We will. We will try out something new before we close out the show. <laughs> this hour has gone by extremely fast, which is a good thing. It, it has gone by fast. Extremely I fast. Looked down. It was like seven o'clock. Looked down again. It's seven thirty. I'm like, oh, it's eight like o'clock. <laughs> Fuck. Uh, <laughs> so, so uh, on the past two shows, um, uh, Chloe, um, part of the Walk Racy Experience, we do a show called the Walk Racy Experience. It's myself and my co-host Kevin, and there's another show called Cereal and Beer. Uh, it's with Kevin and his friend Jeff from Japan, and you know they talk about a whole lot of current events, their opinions, and um, stuff like that. And they do something at the end of every show called rants. They do a nice two to three minute rant on whatever's bothering them, and they vent that out. So I'll ask you, Chloe, uh, 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 as our special guest, what rant do you have? I'm gonna set a timer. Hold on, because Chloe will go on past the three minute mark. Give me one second. Get this timer started. No just problem. That. <laughs> and I will renew it for everybody, Chloe. I'm not just signaling you out. I love you. Don't hurt me. <laughs> All right. Three, two, go. You know what bothers me? Entitled ass people. That's what bothers me. Okay? Yesterday, I cannot tell you how many people walked away from me mid-sentence after asking me to help them find something. Why do you do that? Why are you walking away from me? Listen to me speak, goddammit. And, okay, and then also, another pet peeve of mine is when somebody comes up to me and just goes like, bug spray. Bro, uh, I have I am a person. You can like say hi to me before just shouting a thing that you want at me, maybe a little bit. And like the other night, this lady got mad at one of my coworkers because she lost her baby shoe. She screamed at one of my coworkers because she couldn't find the shoe. Girl, how is that my problem? How is that my fault? 
and just entitled ass people, especially on the roads. The roads today were horrible. They were horrible. Like, I'm not even kidding you. I have an all wheel drive Subaru and I was sliding going straight. My traction control turned off multiple times. The roads were horrible today. And yet, there were still people trying to pass me on the right. Like, people just almost getting themselves and other people in danger and just people being horrible. That's what makes me angry. And while I'm on the people being horrible thing, there are many things happening in the world, most of which Becky and I talked about the other night, but there are many genocides and ethnic cleansing happening cleansings happening right now and that makes me angry i am so angry about that i mean we're talking about like three months october november december three three and a half months of a genocide that has been broadcasted to the world right i see it every day when i go on tiktok and it still hasn't stopped and we don't know when it's going to stop i am talking about palestine just so you know um, and that makes me angry. It makes me angry that people can't be more compassionate in general, in a worldwide sense, in a local sense, and in an everything sense. Yep. I don't know if I still have three. Do I still have more time? <laughs> uh, you have 30 I... seconds. I have 30 seconds. People are horrible, but they're also great sometimes. But it makes me really angry when people can't have empathy and compassion for other people. Because I see my nieces and nephews and every child that is currently living in Palestine or Yemen or Sudan or any or the Congo, any of the places that need our help right now. And it's just angering to me that other people don't operate that way, I guess, that they won't see their children in those children. All right. Time's up. Adrian, you want to go next and you tell you open this can of worms? <laughs> um, I, I will go last. All right. Let me reset this timer. <laughs> All right. What makes me angry is the fact that just because I'm female does not mean I know less than men. The fact that I'm a female and I'm a supervisor in an electronics department people think i don't know video games people think i don't know tvs or the fact that people ask me about product knowledge with things that i'm like listen i work here i'm not passionate enough about this one thing which is printers or security cameras because number one i don't have a home i have an apartment okay i have a home i don't have a house i don't give too much of a rat's ass about security protocols because i don't need it right now should I probably care a little bit more? Maybe. I don't know. We'll find out later on. But the fact that me being where I am, oh, you don't know about this. Get me somebody who does. I'm like, nobody else knows. And they're like, you're just a dumb female. I'm like, oh, excuse me. Another thing that pisses me off, do not whistle or snap your fingers to get somebody's attention. It's different if you're friends with them and you're doing the wolf howl whistle. That's fine. I do it all the time to people. I do it to Chloe. I do it to Dakota. That's fine. Because of the fact that it's in good humor, and when they turn around and they see it's me, and they start laughing. It's fine. But when I had a customer today whistling to try to get my attention, I was about ready to turn around and be like, I am not a dog. I might be a bitch, but I'm not the French word of the bitch. I am a female. I am a human being. Please... If you need help, just say, excuse me, is anybody around? I'm not gonna be mad about that. I'm gonna be more pissed off when you're whistling or snapping at me like I'm beneath you because I work in retail. I feel like anyone who works customer service of any kind and they have to deal with the public, we are not less than the person who's sitting behind a desk and going, oh, I'm typing up numbers because I'm so smart. Oh, I gotta send emails. You're not better than me. I have degrees. I'm smart. I know what I'm talking about. Don't talk down to me. Don't talk to me like I'm an idiot. Especially if you realize, oh, this person who I'm talking to, who from behind has long hair and shaved back of the head, they gotta be a guy. And then you turn around and you see that I've got boobs. 
does that mean I'm stupid? My brain is not in my chest. It is up between my head, between my ears. I have a way of thinking. I can talk through things. If I don't know something, I will fully admit that. I'm not going to bullshit anybody. And I will fully admit, I don't know this. I need to do research on this or I'm going to find somebody who knows. But if I know for a fact, nobody knows anything, I'm going to tell them. Another thing is, why do people have to argue with me about policies? I don't make the policies. I don't make up these rules. But that's my time. <laughs> I can allow an extra 30 seconds. It's okay. I was um, thoroughly enjoyed by this. I was thoroughly entertained. No, the rapidness <laughs> needs to calm down. <laughs> <laughs> the foaming at the mouth is about to okay. start. So gotcha. Adrian, in three, two... Okay, my rant is something simple. I'm a very zen person. I think Becky knows this by now. Ashley knows this. Dakota knows this. Uh, Chloe, you'll probably catch up on this as well. I'm a very peaceful guy. I love my zen. I'm an old man. What really grinds my gears, giggity, is that why do people hate peace? I'll let that hang in the air for a second. I'll say it again. Why do people hate peace? And what I mean by that is I'm a perpetually happy person. And with, with, with my job, I, I encounter a whole lot of people who are stressed, very angry, very just, just tired out, and they need that particular service that I offer. So when they come in and they see my smiling face or my just calm demeanor, nine times out of 10, people ask me, why are you so happy? Why are you smiling so much? What do you have to be, what do you have to be so happy about? And my response is, because I'm alive. And they give me a really, really funky look. And I come to realize that, generally speaking, a good chunk of people really don't like happiness. Most people love drama. They love, you know, um, they love uh, confrontation because it adds meaning to their lives. Full circle here. So they need something to spark them. They need something of a confrontation because if you're, if you're at peace with yourself or you're happy, you have nothing to complain about, you're boring. This is why you can watch the news. People will never talk about at the water cooler about a cat being saved out of a tree. They'd rather talk about the 15 car pile up on I-95 or someone gets angry because their sandwich is made wrong and they blast somebody in the face with a shotgun. They never really revel in the happiness of somebody else because it's boring. So that's why a whole lot of the people I interact with really don't like me because I'm always in a good mood. I'm always happy. I'm always cheerful. When I'm out and about, I always have a very calm, very nice demeanor. And people will ask me, how are you this happy? And my response is, why wouldn't I be? And that really shuts them up. And sometimes it really makes them think. Because happy people love being by themselves. Because we don't want to deal with the outside world. We don't want to deal with people who are just perpetually in a snit. And how many, how much more seconds do I have left? How many minutes do I have left? 30 seconds. 30 seconds? Sweet. And along with that, and of course, people are listening to the show right now, the Out of Context Podcast, and it's really been a deep conversation, so let me muck it up a bit. Dick fart, dick fart, dick fart, dick fart, and jokes, and penis, and dick and fart. Murder boner. Yeah, murder boner. There we go. So that is my rant. That felt good. <laughs> that was nice. I went to a rage room recently, and that felt equally cathartic. I, I think we got to start implementing this. Um, I mm -hmm. think we're going to steal that from the cereal and beer podcast. I, I like this. I like, the fact, has gone to bed. <laughs> I like the fact that we had a timer set for it. Mm -hmm. But, unfortunately, folks, as much fun as this podcast has been, it is getting late. I know I sound old now. It's 8 o'clock. I'm saying it's late. I'm like, when did I become 50 years old? And I'm like, 8 o'clock's late. I gotta go to bed. Early bed, early <laughs> up. Um, anyways. <laughs> so, we've got to wrap this up. Um, Chloe, if people want to get a hold of you, where can they contact you? Um... They can contact my butthole at mytoes.org. <laughs> Giggity. Giggity. Um, as long as it's a clean butthole, that's all that matters. Maybe. No, no, it's gonna have You'll have streaks. to look to know. <laughs> it's going to have the streaks and the hairs and everything. Um, if anybody wants to get a hold of me, they can get a hold of me at 
raccoonrabbit695 at gmail.com. Feel free to send me an email if you have anything that you want us to discuss during this podcast or you have a different point of view. Feel free to send me an email and I will review them and discuss them with everybody who is involved with the Out of Context podcast. And Adrian, where can people find you and this podcast? Yeah, so you can find this wherever you find your podcasts, whether it be Spotify, iHeartRadio, um, Pandora, Player.fm, um, or, or Listen Notes, or subscribe to us on walkerac76.podbean.com. That's walkerac76.podbean.com. Give us a like, subscribe, everything in between. That's where you can find all of our links for Twitter, YouTube, and yeah, keep on supporting the experience. Support the Out of Context podcast, Cereal and Beer, Walk Race Experience. Look at, look for the old shows as well. And we thank everybody for downloading, for listening, and interacting with us. And, of course, uh, Chloe, we talk about how people listen to us all over the world. Let me give you just a couple of stats for the month of January. So right now we have, of course, people in the U.S. are listening to us. Um, and, of course, once again, these are stats from every single month. So I'll do a quick Animaniacs uh, run through here. Ohio, Florida, California, Michigan, Texas, Tennessee, Virginia, Illinois, Kentucky, Louisiana, New York, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania have listened to us so far. Now all over the world, check this out. We have Japan, Andorra, and Israel. So those people right now have been listening to us in the month of January. So people either stumble upon us by mistake or they actually go out of their way to listen to us because they love who we are which is really surprising. So, as we wrap up the show, I will leave the last and final word for uh, our host, Big Time Bex. All right, well, in memory of Ashley, because who doesn't love a bad dad joke? I know for a fact I love them. And this one is actually for my manager. What language do cats speak? What? Persian. Persian. I saw it on his Facebook. Oh. He's also my manager. <laughs> well, that's not fair. All right, hold on. I got to find one more thing. Apparently, Chloe likes to rain on my parade and excuse the blinding light because, you know, I got a cheap webcam. If um, I can answer it, it's not a good dad joke. All right. <laughs> What is red and bad for your teeth? What? Blood. A brick. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, everyone. My jokes. <laughs>